Hello, I'm Martin A. David, also known as Mardav. I'm an arts practitioner. I'm proud to be reading from my friend Thomas Claw's amazing prize-winning novel, Painted Oxen. Charybdis. Sometimes I have trouble telling my dreams from reality. The farther I travel from some experience, the more unsure I am that it actually happened. Just like a dream. The closer I am to it, the more sure I am that it's real. Where's the line? How can I trust that my image of the world is not a trick of the brain? That the external world is certain, and the internal is imaginary. What if it's the other way around? What if the things I rely upon are actually made of air? Why is it that five people in a room witnessing the same event will have sometimes dramatically different accounts of what happened. Could there ever be such a thing as objective truth? I read a news story before I left the States about a man who regained his sight after having lived without it for decades. What he discovered was that his brain had forgotten how to see. He had perfect vision, but his eyes didn't work. Things he could do effortlessly when blind became frustrating and laborious. Familiar objects became foreign, as if he awoke one day with a profound form of amnesia. Simply picking up a cup of coffee from the table took an extraordinary effort. In a blind world, things like shape and texture are everything. So visual images meant almost nothing to him when he regained sight. In short, he was forced to create a whole new relationship between himself and every other object in his world. Maybe the rest of us could use this kind of radical perspective shift. Maybe it would help our, us see ourselves and the world more clearly. More and more, I get the feeling that I don't know anything, that I've been sleepwalking since I was a kid. I had an experience when I was in Europe a while back. It's known as a Kundalini awakening. I was in an ancient underground chapel meditating when these flashes of light shot up from the base of my spine toward my head. My whole body was filled with a surge of electricity. I know it sounds crazy, but unlike some things, I'm sure this happened. Anyway, around the same time, I started having these dreams. In one series of dreams, I am a lion. And I'm going around doing lion things. And when I wake up, I'm sometimes shocked to find myself in human form. For an instant, I think I'm dreaming. I think I'm a lion dreaming that I'm a man. Eventually, I get up make coffee, brush my teeth, 
And somewhere along the way, I settle on a reality where I'm not a lion. I guess my point is that if I can have dreams that I believe are real, especially while I'm in them, how is that any different than what is happening right now? How is it any different from what I believe is reality? When I was a child, I secretly believed that the world I knew while I was asleep was the real world, and that my waking life was really just a dream. I've set down that idea for long spaces at a time, but it always has a way of catching my attention again, of reminding me that it's still on the shelf with the other forgotten distractions. I think it hangs around because I know there's something to it. We dismiss and forget many of our childhood notions at our peril. The world is as big as our ideas of it. Despite the vividness of some of my dreams, it's usually hard for me to remember them with any consistency. Even the ones I remember have gaps in them sometimes large gaps, sometimes they're mostly gaps. Given what little information I'm able to collect about the dream world, how can I really know anything about it? Whatever some people might say, it seems to me that a world in which I can fly, bend time and space, and meet with people who have been dead for years. Deserves more consideration than it gets. If I weigh the waking world on one side of the scale and the dream world on the other, which one is more substantial? Doesn't a world of endless possibilities seem more likely to contain the whole of our lives than the fraction of the world we call real? I awake on the floor, so I must have slept, and I probably incorporated the screaming Hindi television shows into my dreams, but I don't remember them. My friend from down under pulls himself upright and rests against his backpack. It is surprisingly peaceful in here. No television opera, no bustling crowds, just the sleepy morning stretch of the slender life, light of dawn. Through the glass walls, we see the city start to wake up. Hungry taxi wallahs already lining up outside. Their scurrying about reminds me of watching an ant colony under glass. I watch our packs while the Aussie goes outside to find us a ride. I'm a pretty confident traveler, but he insists that I beware of thieves. Not the type you'd imagine. Thugs lurking in alleyways or pickpockets. Apparently, there's a whole subculture here, sub-economy here based on scamming tourists. For instance, there are more than a few taxi drivers who are paid to take you 
only to certain hotels, no matter where you tell them you want to go. So, make sure you know where you're going, set the price for the ride before you get in, and don't pay a rupee more than agreed upon when you get out. It helps to know. There are generally three prices for everything. The Indian price, the Westerner price, and the naive tourist price. The Aussie comes back in and says he found a ride for 150 rupees. That's about $3.50 U.S., he says. We can split it. So we grab our bags, and he leads us through the tangle of cars and rickshaws crowding the pavement outside the airport. He scans the faces of the drivers until he finds the right one. We put our backpacks in the trunk and jump into the back seat. Next to the driver sits another man whose purpose is uh, unclear. Even though the Aussie was specific about what, where we need to go, a short distance into the ride, he realizes we're going in a different direction. He sits up and says, no, this doesn't look right. He explains that we're not going to a hotel. We need to go to the train station. We're not actually going to the train station, of course. This is the trick the Aussie devised in self-preservation, because the place we want to go is near the train station. But if the driver and his friend in the front seat know we need a room, we won't get to where we're going. The conversation escalates, and the Aussie yells at them to stop stop the car and let us out. We get out, open the trunk, and take out our backpacks. He throws a hundred rupees on the ground in front of the driver. The driver is indignant. He says he'll call the police. The Aussie tells him to go ahead. He'll be happy to report him. The driver calms down noticeably and says, the police won't be necessary, that this is an acceptable fee for the distance they drove us. We walk a couple of kilometers and ask people for directions to the Paraganj and make sure we get the same story from more than one person. The Aussie says that rather than look ignorant, most Locals will just point in a direction, even if they don't really know how to get where you want to go. I'm starting to wonder what kind of shape I'd be in if I hadn't met him. There really are cows wandering the streets in India, lying down in the middle of traffic, and the pigs eating all manner of trash, including what the cows leave behind. Because nothing goes to waste here, locals also take advantage of the cow patties, scooping them up and forming them into flat, round discs, which they stick to the outside walls of their houses. When the patties dry, they're peeled from the walls and burned as cooking fuel, in the open fire pits inside their huts. This is India's recycling program. Eventually, we find the Paharganj, and along with it, a string of guest houses for backpackers. Crowded with cafes, chai stalls, spice wallas, the Paharganj is also the area's main bazaar where the locals sell all types of handmade goods, saris and shawls, as well as a trove of souvenir items. Bridging the past with the present, it sits right between Old Delhi and New Delhi.
If you're a Buddhist, you might think of it as the middle road. If you're a Catholic, maybe it's purgatory. For me, it's the perfect place to explore the in-between world of the land of dreams. We're here before anything is open, and roll down steel doors, line the whole street. It looks like a long strip of storage units. Adding to the scenery, there are crumbling brick facades and outdoor urinals. An old man sleeps on a rope bed in an abandoned structure without a roof. And in the middle of the street, a large pile of garbage has collected for so long it has become a traffic median. Several pigs feast on the spoils. And there's no way to describe the smells. The Aussie is walking a couple of paces in front of me, but he turns and grins as he looks at me. A little culture shock, he asks. I nod reluctantly. After walking around to a half dozen guest houses and asking questions at each, the Aussie is satisfied with one. For what the taxi ride should have cost, we get rooms for the night. After we check in and clean up a bit, we meet in the cafe on the ground floor and order up some omelets and chai. I can't believe there's actually a cafe in this place. The Aussie complains about the prices a little, 60 rupees for an omelet, but the food is way better than the walk-in would indicate. And I begin to learn that cost is relative to place. He says, I have to forget what things cost in the States and learn what they're worth here so I don't get ripped off. It becomes an art for backpackers. Some even take it to extremes, like opting to sleep on the open roofs of guest houses rather than pay for a room. These frugal purists will haggle over the price of almost everything, not satisfied until they know they've chiseled the profit margin down until it's see-through. There's another conversation that often gets layered over the one about what things are worth in India. It's the one about what things should be worth. Should the world be flat? Should money be the same everywhere? And what does that do to culture? Some would say America has homogenized too much already. Leave things as they are. Others would say that's just veiled xenophobia, that these people deserve a higher standard of living. I'm uh, on the fence. But I don't have a lot of money either. And this is one of the few places left in the world where a guy like me can still do this kind of traveling. None of this money talk matters to me right now, though. All the excited anxiety of travel, all the wonder if planes will be on time, if me and my luggage will both get to where we're heading, if I'll be able to figure out how to get around once I get there, all that's gone. I'm there, or rather, here. Unless, of course, this is a dream.